Hello there, my friends. Welcome back. Um, my hair is not done all nice. Don't have makeup on, but I'm here for you because uh, inf information security is super fun, and uh, this is a super fun topic because it's lots of like easy little things you can do to find information out about things or people or businesses or places. Um, that I'm sure all of you will only use for good. Um, so, uh, yeah, and just a reminder that this season, uh, this month of content, at the end of this, I'll be taking a month break so that I can hopefully get a little bit ahead of myself um, so I'm not, you know, trying to catch up every week. And just with pandemic vibes, my, my productivity is not as high as it usually is. So that month will be super useful for me. And uh, yeah, there's lots of content to review and I'll still be around in the Discord or if you want to reach out and just have a chat, just see where you're at, what you want to do maybe. Uh, you, I'm always available for that stuff. Um, or at least I will let you know my schedule uh, when I'm available for that stuff. So let's get started. Um, so as you all know, you're the teacher. I'm just a lady in the bottom right corner of your screen with red hair who uh, points you at cool stuff. But uh, the learning is all going to be done by you, and you're going to teach yourself a lot more than I could, ever could. But I'll point you in some interesting places where you can find uh, further cool stuff. So let's get this slideshow started. So yes, as I said, you are your teacher. And this episode for season three of the Let's Learn InfoSec module is for open source intelligence. Um, so that's a term taken from uh, like intelligence agencies classify the, the types of intelligence they're, they're able to gather from and like the sources. Like this is like 1950s CIA, KGB, you know, as we started that sort of like information war um, with Russia or the formerly the Soviet Union, intelligence agencies codified a lot of like intelligence practices and those still inform security to this day because um, they're, they're more like principles, like security principles. And you know, a lot of it is uh, Sun Tzu art of war. Like, I mean, this type of stuff goes way back, but open source intelligence is kind of a newer thing just because of how much information is freely available on the internet. So that's OSINT. Uh, there's other ones like uh, signal intelligence where you're determining things from signals you can pick up. There's HumeInt, which is human intelligence, what you can, what you can get from humans or extract out of humans. Um, and so open source, this stuff is freely out there on the internet. And uh, so we can use the internet to find information out about things. And I mean, I think Gen Z is probably uh, pretty good at this because, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know how education works anymore where you can just Google the answers for mostly everything, or you can plug it in, uh, uh, what's, is it Bing that has uh, the like mathematical functions? Maybe it isn't Bing. But one of them, you can plug in straight mathematical equations and get answers. Um, I guess it's better than buying a $200 graphing calculator. But uh, regardless, open source intelligence. So what are we going to talk about today? We've got open source intelligence. What is the concept? Ah, Wolfram Alpha. Alpha. Thank you, Plops. That's the, the uh, search engine that you can also plug mathematical equations into, and it will spit back answers. You can all do all sorts of stuff with Wolfram. Um, so uh, yes, open source intelligence, we're just going to talk about the concept a little bit more. And then we're going to talk about what we can do with search engine logic, which uh, is pretty surprising. And lastly, we'll talk about this tool called Shodan.io. And we'll see some interesting things we can find out on there. I've mentioned it briefly in, in other classes, but we'll actually look at the tool today and see what it can do. And uh, see what people are probably using it for right this very moment. So, uh, orphan, open source intelligence. I already did my spiel, spiel here uh, about what that is, but yeah, there's a lot of information on the internet. Um, when I, I, I was trying to get a graduate degree in threat intelligence uh, or cyber intelligence um, before I started at Schwab, but it was a lot of work. It was a really good grad program, um, but uh, 
it was interesting that we had like a find information about someone project and I picked someone who was like a friend of my dad's and uh, because of that age group it was a lot more difficult to find information on him like personal information I mean granted I shouldn't be looking too hard but there was not informa much information about him, even though he was kind of famous in some circles. All of it was in books. Like, if I would have gone to libraries, I would have gotten way more information uh, about this person. But, um, yeah, so it, it definitely, as, as it comes closer and closer to this generation, there's going to be more and more information and paper trails, or I guess e-paper trails? Um, but, uh, yeah, there's a lot out there. So, um, something we do generally, uh, in problem solving, but it's a particular style of like approaching a problem to like constrain what you need to do next and have it in a repeatable format, sort of like the incident response life cycle that we talked about previously, um, is something called gap analysis. And so as the name portends, uh, you're, you're finding the gaps that you do have and then working to close those gaps. So an example set of questions we could go through. We start with, what do I know? We're going to classify the information that I have. Is it just someone's name? If, if all I have is the name, at least I have something. Uh, but, uh, you know, classify all the information you know about this person or business or whatever it is you're trying to research. Next, we're going to look at what does this mean? Uh, so this is sort of like how it links to other things. How are you going to take what you know and find other things off of it? So uh, someone's name, they're going to be registered. Uh, maybe they registered a business. Maybe they, uh, I mean, uh, they, they've got a Facebook, I'm sure. And uh, I mean, there's a lot of John Smiths out there, but if you just keep searching, you'll eventually find them. And uh, what, what you can do with the information that you have is what this means. Next, we're going to be, so what do I need to know? So now, now you're drawing, you have this information. How do you get what you want to know over here? And how does what you know right now help you get there? Uh, and then lastly, uh, how do I find out? This is the step of like actually performing the uh, closing the gap uh, in gap analysis. And so this, this is just sort of a, a relative framework of how you might uh, constrain your investigation. Because if you kind of just, you don't want to get lost in just looking at everything uh, when what you know might not be useful to connect to other things that you don't know yet. Um, so again, it's just a, another problem solving framework uh, or model. And as we talked about, uh, you know, in the very first class, you know, problem solving is the skill set that this requires. But don't worry, you're already good at it. You do it all the time. And your brain was specifically evolved to do this one thing. So this is just another tool in your toolkit to uh, solve problems and find information. So some of the cool things that we could gather um, on the Internet is uh, password reset open source intelligence. This one is kind of super fascinating and we'll actually go over an example in the next slide. Um, but the reset password function of various services, uh, you know, it's trying to be helpful, but um, it's designed in a way that is actually leaking information about the person. Uh, so when you reset password for uh, Facebook, it gives you asterisk at asterisk.com, but the number of asterisks is the actual number. Oh, student doctor, that's very sweet. Thank you. Um, and happy to have you. Thank you for subscribing. Um, but just the number of characters is correctly asterisked. So that gives you some information about how long the email address is. So if you're like, maybe you have like three emails in your list, list of things that what do I know? Now you know which one it is because of the number of characters. Um, some are even worse. The worst one is Twitter, which is it gives you the first two letters and then the exact number of asterisks in the email followed by the first letter of the domain in the email followed by an exact number of asterisks dot asterisk, but probably com or whatever. But uh, like 
If it starts with O and it's seven letters, it's Outlook. If it starts with G and it's five letters, it's Gmail. You, you, like the amount of information that is leaked by just the first letter is significant. And uh, so we'll see this in action in the next slide. It's uh, pretty silly, but it's interesting just at all. Like uh, before I learned this, I was not super aware that just the reset password function could be giving my information away. So uh, Google, Twitter, Yahoo, all have some bad ones. Uh, Instagram and LinkedIn actually just cause an automatic reset. They they don't <laughs> do any sort of like, hey, is, does it look like this? Um, but let's see, uh, Microsoft and Google both give, you, both give you the last two digits of the recovery phone number. So if you look up that person on public records, which we'll also do on myself, uh, if you want my phone number, it's not hard to find. Um, but it gives you the last two digits of the phone number, so you could match to that and find out their actual phone number. So, yeah, there's a lot of information that can leak out that way. Uh, next, we've got... Oh, i got to get this right. There we go. Reverse image search. Uh, we'll briefly go over this, not an actual example, but uh, a lot of times this is a useful one uh, for identifying bots. I mean, there's tons of ways to identify bots on Twitter. Um, bots are usually used just to push an agenda of some kind. Uh, 4chan loves pushing their agendas with bots. But, uh, and they, they make like tool sets where like, oh, look, you can set up your bot and help us, you know, spread our culture uh, out to the world. But uh, reverse image search is useful because a lot of times they use a profile image that can be easily searched for. So you throw, if you throw a, if you throw a picture into, uh, let's see, what are some of the good ones? Uh, there's yandex.ru, um, or maybe it's just a Russian site, but regardless, Yandex has an image search. That's probably one of the better ones for some reason. It's really good with the images and matching images to metadata. Uh, there's Google, obviously. You can go to images.google.com and you can uh, plug in an image there. Ooh, yeah, yeah, student doctor mentioned uh, they've heard of machine learning tools that generate unique photos of people that don't exist. And yeah, there's a whole new world of like open source deception, I guess it would be, that, uh, you know, machine learning and deep fakes are going to be a whole new thing. And especially deep fakes with video. Like, I don't know if you've seen the, like someone did a remaster of the, uh, Oh, uh, there was a Martin Scorsese movie that had Robert De Niro and Al Pacino playing characters that were meant to be younger than they look because they're old now. And someone did a machine learning uh, deep fake to make them look young. Uh, they, they've also thrown in uh, different actors into Robert Downey Jr. as uh, uh, Dr. What's-His-Face in Back to the Future and uh, the Spider-Man boy. I'm not good with celebrities. Uh, Spider-Man kid as uh, Marty McFly. But there's just tons of them. And eventually it's just going to be famous figures. As long as there's enough video to generate your face and like map your face to the motions it makes, it can be mapped to another face thanks to machine learning. And those those machine learning tools uh, will be generating faces too. So yeah, it's going to be a whole different world. And uh, get ready. But... Uh, reverse image search can be used for a lot of things, but that's one of the ways to identify sock puppet accounts, which are like accounts set up to to look like they, they have more of a real story than a bot. A bot looks is very predictable. Um, a sock puppet might have a little more detail, a more fleshed out personality, um, but they might be using pictures that they've taken from someone else. Uh, so a reverse image search might be able to determine that. Uh, next, we've got image EXIF data. So every image you take um, with most modern cameras uh, contains a little extra information about what's the flash on, uh, pixel dimension, software used, uh, lot, lot, lots of like processing and image related information. But something that happened very commonly from like digital cameras from like year 2000 to like 2015, and some still do this, is they they put GPS coordinates inside of the EXIF data. So if you upload that image to the internet, it uh, may have the EXIF data attached. Now, thankfully, Facebook and Twitter, I think, have things where like, do you want to remove EXIF data? And it might be the default rather than asking. It should be the default because who who really needs to know that? 
But uh, just for example, uh, let me show you. Oh, did I lose the tab? Uh, well, let me put this over here so you can see. I won't do it all by myself. Um, XF data online. Uh, so let's just say I have a picture of, is it this one? It's this one. So what's this? Oh, look, it's my kitty cat, Theo. Hi, Theo. Uh, so it's just a cute picture of my kitty cat. But thankfully the default was off, but I turned on location data. And so if we scroll down, like you can see, this is a lot of, uh, well, it tells you when it was taken, which might be useful information. If you can place when that person, where that person was when, if you can identify landmarks in the picture, you may not need GPS coordinates. Uh, but we go down a little further and here we are, GPS longitude, GPS latitude. Well, let's go ahead and throw that in Google Maps because I don't care if you know where I live because uh, I've got cool neighbors and I've got cameras. Um, but also, I could kick your ass. Um, but if I throw that into Google, oh, there's me right there. Got taken inside that house. Uh, so that's where my kitty cat lives. If you want to come say hello to my kitty cat, he's not very nice. You don't want to meet him, but I have other kitty cats. But regardless, a lot of things have kept the location on um, inside their camera settings. And so you might want to turn that off just if you're posting pictures of, uh, you know, people you care about. So XF data is another place that they can hide or they can gather things from. Um, online tools, I'm just going to leave this open because uh, this light is so bright, but it makes it look like I have perfect skin. So, um, so I'm going to link to this document because it's amazing. Um, but this, this Google doc has tons of like, I mean, you can see here maps, satellites, street view, location searches, image verification, social media, even telegram, which is encrypted, but you can find out interesting information by saying, by starting up an emulator giving it a GPS spoof of like, hey, I'm in uh, Cologne, Germany. And then you can like add people near me and it'll show you telegram accounts of people in Cologne, Germany. Whoops. Uh, but uh, yeah, lots of interesting information here. The people in phone numbers one, uh, peoplefastsearch.com. Uh, if you really want to know, you can throw my name in there and get my address, my phone number, all my family members. <laughs> It's uh, pretty common at this point. Uh, the information just, I don't know if it comes through like credit report companies or, or where all of this is stored, but uh, these types of sites, uh, they're often free, but then they have like a detailed background check link, affiliate link to something that costs money. But uh, yeah, you can find a lot of stuff on there, especially in the United States. Uh, and name check also checks usernames, uh, which is an interesting feature. Regardless, I'll link you to this tool so you can play around with it. There's so much cool stuff on here. You can also get uh, the newest satellite imagery. Oh, am I? Am I in a chat? Oh, that was weird. They're listening. Um, that was weird. I don't think I'm in Discord or interesting. Regardless, uh, I will link this tool so you can check out and play with it and see what you can find. Uh, maybe just play with yourself. That's safe. Um, yeah, so back to information gathering. So uh, just real briefly, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, go over a case study where uh, I saw this in action last week. Or maybe it was the week before, but regardless, perfect timing. Our case study is Jim Halpert, AKA John Krasinski, AKA CIA operative Jack Ryan, but we'll still always see him as Jim because I mean, it's Jim. Um, but uh, it's kind of sad, but uh, it shows that celebrities are people too. Um, God, this light is so bright. Okay. So 
Uh, this fella, Cody Johnson, I'm not super familiar with him, but uh, he made this this tweet. This account was made today, and these are their only tweets. So I guess I'm wondering, is this definitely John Krasinski or only probably John Krasinski? So, I mean, what it is ultimately is uh, this person, this account, making very defensive claims about John Krasinski. Uh, apparently, people on Twitter uh, who are prone to get mad at anything uh, are generally pissed uh, with just the, the idea of Jack Ryan uh, because the CIA uh, has done some terrible, terrible stuff uh, in South America, in the Middle East. Uh, we sort of mess, we install dictators. It's, it's not great history. So uh, a movie like Jack Ryan sort of glorifies action hero-ness and people get mad about it and they're like, oh, Jim, how dare you? And then he made this uh, during the pandemic. He started this Some Good News uh, video, which is really sweet. People just send in videos of people being sweet because uh, we all need some good news. Anyhow, uh, I guess John was seeing some of these tweets criticizing him and just couldn't bear to not say anything. And saying it on his main account would look kind of petty and kind of sad. So, I mean, if you if you look at some of these tweets, it's just it's just angry. But it's almost too specific uh, about uh, some of the things about John Krasinski, especially this one right here. I don't know how well you can see it, but uh, I'm not gonna repeat what they said here about John Krasinski, because it's kind of mean, but they're like calling him out for a fight. And Joey Gorp 85 says, great, well, John lives in Brooklyn, so you might get your chance. He's also six foot four and 200 pounds of muscle and Navy SEAL and weapons trained. I encourage you to find him and do just that. Tell them to their faces. Which is just like, I mean, who knows? <laughs> 200 pounds, like, it's the people who know that are him and Emily Blunt, his wife. Like, there's, I mean, it's too specific, and this account was just created in one day, and then suddenly it's just defending John Krasinski left and right. And then, so all this to say, it's maybe John Krasinski, but. Uh, I don't know if you remember our little uh, uh, password reset OSINT. Well, someone did a little check for Joey Gorp 85 on Twitter. And would you look at that? Joey Gorp 85. We found the information associated with your account. There's the first two letters, the exact number of asterisks at O with seven letters, aka Outlook.com. <laughs> There's John Krasinski's email, if you want to email him. He's probably changed it by now because he's probably gotten some terrible, terrible emails, which is very sad. And I don't I don't want to pick on him too much because I, I could understand a person in the public light, uh, you know, getting attacked for reasons you don't quite understand or empathize with fully. And uh, I mean, he's just a human, guys. He's having an emotion reaction and he wants to get on Twitter and just yell at people because <laughs> we've all yelled at people on the internet. And you know, when you can't do it because you're a like public personality, I can imagine that's very stressful. And uh, granted, he probably needs to talk more with his therapist than Twitter and that would probably help more. But uh, I mean, it's 99% positive. This is John Krasinski and it's like, it kind of just gives itself away with that kind of open source intelligence. So folks, uh, the moral of the story is to uh, have tight operational security or otherwise you give yourself away. Oh, poor John. We still love you, Jim. Uh, all right. So poor Jim. Next up, we've got uh, search engine logic. So this is just how to say the magic words. Um, because search engines do, you know, when, when I see my parents use search engines, they just ask it questions. And thankfully at this point, uh, this didn't used to work nearly as well, uh, 10 years ago, but because Google is used to people asking it questions, it's not trying to search it exactly like a, like a database. It's trying to do a little bit of like, I guess, machine learning about how they're phrasing something and like which words to take out to kind of get them the results that they're ultimately asking for. But the way a search engine look uh, works and 
when you use uh, you know tools on your computer to search, it's going to use more of this Boolean logic. And Boolean uh, is basically like using ands and or statements to combine phrases together or pieces together that we want to search for this and this or this or this or this and this and this or this and this and this. And that type of thing helps build a more specific search. So that's the difference between uh, typing uh, laser cat in quotes versus laser cat uh, without quotes. And the quote thing in particular, if we just leave the quotes out, like in the second here, laser cat, this is looking for laser and cat. As So if, if a page returns the word laser and the word cat, it's going to give that back as a result. On the other hand, in closing it with quotes, this is looking only for the phrase, this exact match of laser cat, laser space cat. So if we uh, go ahead and do this, we can just see the number of results shrink significantly. So laser cat, about 306 million results and lots of cats with lasers coming out of their eyes. How cute. Um, but if we enclose that in quotes, what did we have? We had 300, 306 million results. Now we do it in quotes, so just those two words together, right next to each other, in a phrase. Um, laser cat, 334,000. Dropped significantly the number of results that returns. This is super helpful if you're trying to craft a Google search about something that goes together like... Uh, Nissan 350Z or uh, anything that has two words separately and you actually want to look for both of them together, you usually want to enclose it in quotes. Uh, that's going to help you find what you're looking for a lot easier. Um, but then we've got some other cool things we can do here. Oh, it's going to, I don't want to spoil it. Uh, but uh, laser cat versus laser cat. Then uh, we've got some interesting things that we can abuse web crawlers with. Like this, this stuff is normally for just searching, but there are some additional things that uh, things like Google or DuckDuckGo or Yahoo or Bing allow you to perform that can give you a little more useful information. So an example here I have is site colon, in title colon, and in text colon. So site colon uh, that is going to, you could put site colon, uh, like for example, I look up things about Splunk all the time and they have a user community at answers.splunk.com. So if I'm looking for something about Splunk, I will put site colon answers.splunk.com and then the thing that I'm trying to search for because then it just shows me results from that site, uh, which can be super useful. Uh, or if you're doing general tech stuff, Stack Overflow and Stack Exchange are great, you know, sites to narrow down to. Or if you just want to look at GitHub for, you know, a, a type of tool and you're just like, oh, I just want to look at open source tools, then site colon github.com. You're just going to get that type of thing. Um, in title, we'll look for those words in the title. And in text, uh, like the title of the web page, like what your tab shows at the top. Um, and then in text, we'll show you uh, where it, if it's in the document or the page in some place. So for example, with our laser cats, we could, uh, in text, we could put toys and we got 92,000 results. So lots of these are now, you know, things about little laser toys for cats. Um, but we're just getting more specific about what we're able to do. We could do in title play, uh, 18,000 results. So now we're looking at things that cat play toy, but you can see play is in all of these titles here. It's somewhere in there, it's just been cut off. But uh, we could also do in text play. Uh, and we could also do site amazon.com. And then we're just looking at cat toys on Amazon. Uh, so yeah, those are lots of interesting ways where you can uh, mix and match to sort of play with. And this, again, can be used for totally benign purposes, um, but it can also be used to find interesting information when you're trying to find something out about someone or something. The next one, I think, is the most abusable. Um, and you can go ahead and you can look up Google dorks and you'll find tons of articles about uh, how various people perform their searches like this. 
But uh, some of these commands for search engines are super powerful. And that's file type and in URL. So file type is kind of self-explanatory. Uh, the reason this could be bad is, <laughs> let's say site nasa.gov file type PDF. Uh, yeah, Google's like, hey, what the hell are you doing? Um, you very suspicious person, you. Uh, so we got, wow, 479,000 PDFs on NASA.gov. But, uh, and we just, maybe, maybe we just wanted to look at what does NASA have freely available? But then we could maybe type, mm, budget. Oh, now we're looking at PDFs that have to do with budgets. Or maybe we could look at passwords. Oh, interesting. Lots of PDFs about how their uh, password administration works. Uh, lots of things about, oh, look, they use RSA Secure ID tokens. Now we know what NASA uses for their token technology. If RSA Secure ID got uh, had a vulnerability, now we know we could get into NASA with it. Uh, so there's just lots of information that uh, you might be able to find like this. Um, Obviously, utilizing this information is not okay because uh, you could totally get uh, jail time and huge fines for violating the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. Uh, so don't do that. But you can, I mean, you can poke around with this stuff. Obviously, don't use it for anything illegal. Uh, disclaimer. But uh, if you do, you might want to anonymize <laughs> what you're doing. <laughs> uh, but I won't tell you how to do that. You're going to have to figure it out. Um, but yes, it's just fascinating that something like Google, which is just sort of crawling what's freely available on the internet, can give you types of information like this. Uh, the other one I mentioned was in URL. Uh, do I have... I had a document. I don't have one handy, but... Uh, in URL... Oh, there's some I used. Uh, so... WordPress pages have a page called wplogin.php. Um, when I look for this, it's more about uh, wplogin.php and about how to disable uh, crawlers being able to store wplogin.php because there is a file, I think, called robots.txt that you can store on your web server and be like, hey, Google, don't put this in, in the results. But because that... <laughs> Because that file is freely available uh, for web crawlers to use, you can just use a web crawler user agent, pull the robots.txt, and find out what folders uh, are not supposed to be crawled. So you might be able to determine what's in there. Uh, regardless, it's better than them knowing the name of every file in a folder as opposed to just a folder uh, named. But if it's named WordPress, then they know you are using WordPress. I mean, granted, there's other ways to find that out, but. That's the idea, anyhow. So in URL can capture a lot of uh, interesting things just because there are so many like default or generic page names uh, that you could trace by utilizing this in URL function. Um, I will list uh, one of the links at the end of class is going to be a list of some Google hacking database uh, hacks people have submitted, uh, hacks, uh, strong word, but regardless, it's interesting to play around with what you're able to find just on Google. Uh, so that's Google stuff. And next up and last up is Shodan.io. So uh, as the subtitle says, you can check every IP everywhere for everything. And what that means is what Shodan does, it's basically a crawler, but it's hitting every IP address and on every port. So you, there are, oh geez, 16 billion IP, IP version four addresses. Um, we're starting to move to IPv6. I mean, we've said we've been starting to move to IPv6 for like 10 years now but it might actually happen for the public internet uh, and the IPv4 will be used probably still for private IPs, maybe, who knows. Um, but there's a certain amount of addresses and 
ultimately they are owned by companies. Uh, and those IP addresses are handed out by an organization called the IANA. And the number range is from 0 .0 .0 .0 0 0.0.0.0 to 255.255.255.255. Why is it 255? Well, because it's actually 256, which is a, a binary exponent of 2, uh, or is an exponent of binary. So there's 256 addresses, but it's, you know, 256 times 256 times 256 times 256. So you get a, a vast, like, exponential amount of addresses through this addressing system. And uh, computers open sockets uh, via things called ports. So you could, this allows the same IP address to have a number of different ways or, or places that things can talk to it. So, um, the ports are numbered 0 through 65, 535, because 65, 536 is an exponent of 2. Um, but, uh, there are a few reserved, uh, at the end there, I think just above 49,000 something, and that's for, like, ephemeral ports, which we'll talk about uh, in the third episode of this class when we connect to a website. We generate an ephemeral port so that we can talk to this website. But we reach out to websites, usually on port 80 is HTTP traffic, uh, 443 is HTTPS, which is the secure um, H version of HTTP. Um, there's a lot of like general uh, reservations for uh, different ports, and when you take the Security Plus exam, you will be learning a decent amount of what what these ports are. But that doesn't necessarily mean that uh, that traffic is that traffic. Like you could put HTTP on fifty three, but you're going to confuse everything else on the internet because uh, everything else on the internet expects fifty three to be DNS traffic. But if you're an attacker and you wanted to send information back to your infrastructure, uh, you might use port 53 to hide in there. Um, if they don't have any sort of monitoring or alerting that sees, you know, oh, that's not DNS traffic on the DNS port. Interesting. But it's usually unblocked because computers need it to function. So if they don't have monitoring alerting on 53 for non-DNS traffic, then you might be able to get through. Regardless, Shodan.io. Uh, they're scanning all of the internet all the time over and over to find out what response you receive from every IP address and from every port. Um, does the port really matter if I want to set up SSH on a personal server? It doesn't necessarily, but you should definitely not use the default port because uh, when, when attackers are scanning the internet, they might just generally use uh, 22 just to look for SSH and look for open SSH. Uh, so setting it as a different number might make it less attackable, but if you're setting up, um, if you're setting up, uh, SSH server and you just use, uh, certificates to authenticate yourself rather than passwords, that, unless someone hacks you or your file system and gets your certificate, the likelihood of them, you know, getting, getting to that is low. But uh, so Shodan is scanning all the internet all the time just to see what's returned from that IP address. So let's just check out Shodan real quick. Uh, so every once in a while they they uh, they have a deal for a lifetime membership, uh, which you'll uh, you should take advantage of when they do. I think it was like fifty bucks. Um, so I want to show something that's kind of a big deal right now, and I bet you there are some people working overtime fixing this, is uh, there was a new uh, CVE uh, vulnerability for uh, F5s, uh, which is Cisco? Ooh, Cisco F5? Yes, Cisco. Uh, so F5s have... Um, someone released a new CVE that got a score of 10, indicating the highest degree of danger, and all they need to do to exploit it is to send a specifically crafted HTTP request to the traffic management user interface for the big IP configuration. And how simple that looks. Here's a proof of concept that was released. Someone on Twitter put this together. I mean, you can see six hours ago, committed. Um, if you use the curl command, 
uh, which C URL, and I think it means connect URL, something. Regardless, you can pull the it said the etc password file, which will give you usernames um, on a Unix machine. You can pull, pull the hosts file, uh, the license uh, for u utilizing uh, Cisco information, and you can look for commands <laughs> where people are offing as admin. Ah, that's a really, really bad vulnerability because it's so simple. You just type curl in front of this to an IP address that is a Cisco F5 and you will get the thing on the other side. This is a really bad vulnerability that just got released this week. And I can guarantee you there are people working right now to patch their environments because very rarely, I mean, there are some CVs that come out and the patch needs to get in, get in like uh, in a week or two. This is one of those that's like, we need this in right now, this weekend, because people are already seeing these, these exploits. Now that it's public, uh, they're getting hit. And uh, it's not very hard to find Cisco F5s because of Shodan. Uh, because you can look for F5 management interfaces in Shodan. Uh, over here. All right, great. 8,400 probably vulnerable F5s uh, list by country. But you see it's it's pulling information by, by what's being reported back. So uh, 22, uh, SSH was open. They got uh, SSH command back or, or a certificate uh, back and uh, Apache running on 443. But regardless, what Shodan does is breaks down the services or ports that are open on each one of these IP addresses and gives you the banner back of if you try and connect on those ports, what does that feed back to you? So attackers are probably using Shodan.io to uh, find F5s. This one's interesting. It's using the hash of the, uh, the icon that's returned by the page. Uh, I wonder if that gives a different amount. 8,400 results. This one returns 7,900. So interesting, it's a little bit different. But uh, yeah, there's some very busy people this weekend. And uh, so that's how attackers utilize it. And this is probably how um, Mirai, the botnet we talked about last week, um, they were able to identify a ton of Internet thing of Things devices because Internet of Things will often have a very recognizable title uh, for their administration page or the thing they have poked a hole in the network to speak to the outside world. Uh, I mean, there, here's a ton of different devices, but uh, you can see at the end here, there are a few cameras. So here's net surveillance, a Chinese net surveillance one. There's uh, these cameras. So you could just find tons of these IoT devices. And hopefully there's 114,000 active uh, that you can probably talk to. I mean, this number isn't always exact, exact because Shodan's scanning the entire internet, which takes a long time. But uh, that refresh rate, you know, something might go down in that time. Regardless, if you knew there was a default username and password for this particular brand of uh, camera, then you could probably look into that camera. So, uh, yeah, attackers use this, but defenders also utilize it as well because they can notify businesses like, hey, we've, we found this vulnerability and you have something exposed. Uh, as you can see, you can see the IP address and who it's registered to. So some nice security researchers might, you know, email the domain registrar and let all these people know, hey, you've got something that is potentially exploitable open to the internet. And uh, interestingly, there was a botnet, an anti-botnet botnet that would infect uh, a vulnerable uh, IoT device and then flash it with new firmware that doesn't have their vulnerability. So there are like, good, there's like, you know, like good girl and good guy viruses out there that are forcing people to patch. Uh, so it's, you know, it can be used for good. It's not all bad, but uh, Shodan is fascinating and uh, it's an essential tool in the open source intelligence toolkit. 
So uh, that is all I've got on the lecture. Student doctor says, what about the legal consequences of getting authorized access to these webcams prior to informing the owners? Yeah, it's a it's a fine line. And there have actually been reports of like security researchers being like, hey, I see you've got a vulnerability. I'm trying to help. And then they're like, hey, you you accessed our systems. And it's like, no, I just saw that it was vulnerable. Um, regardless, it's a, it's a fine line to walk. You shouldn't be dabbling in that just as just starting out. Uh, but uh I guess the fine line there would be, did you actually access or did you say just use Shodan to see that, oh, you have this, it's probably vulnerable, I'm just letting you know. I think in that in that situation, you have the legal protection because you didn't actually access anything. Uh, they are publicly displaying that banner. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, Plop says, don't do it. Uh, yeah, you definitely shouldn't. I'm just showing you that it exists. Uh, and all risk taken uh, is on y'all. But uh, thank you for asking that question because that is important. And Hunts to Fly, thank you for joining. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, don't abuse these powers, but it's good to know them. And it's also good to know so that you don't leak any information and you're sort of aware of what leaks out of your online identity. Uh, Delayed Swagger asks, are Macs as bad as people say, security and otherwise? I mean, we all have our opinions. Everything has vulnerabilities. And actually, Windows actually gets the, uh, is usually the, the target for, uh, as like, oh, it's not secure. But ultimately, the reason that it, that is true is because, uh, the vast majority of the business world uses Windows. There are far more installations of Windows compared to Mac OS X uh, in the business environment. I think it's uh, like a while ago, it was like 90%, but I think it's maybe down to 80% now. So people generally targeted Windows machines because that's where more of the market is. So that's where when you're doing making viruses and ransomware and such, you would probably go to towards Windows. But what this kind of, because there was more focus on how Windows machines were vulnerable, because they were just purposely developing exploits for that, um, it left Mac users feeling a sense of safety that uh, was just because attackers hadn't been knocking on the door the whole time. I can't remember. It's not, is it Hardbleed or Shellshock? Is that the app? Was Shellshock? the uh mac or was it no heartbleed was ssl what was there was a mac vulnerability that had been in the kernel for like 14 years it might have been shell shock um but uh that that vulnerability has had existed in the kernel for over 10 years and probably, possibly nobody was exploiting it or they were very secretive about exploiting it for years and not telling anyone. But, uh, I mean, it's all, it's a mixture of the vendors being good about security practices and Apple surprisingly is super like privacy focused in other ways. Um, in that they often are sort of like not super responsive to government requests to just unlock phones and, build back doors and, and that sort of thing. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of legal, uh, there's a lot of bad legislation being pushed, um, by uninformed tech illiterate senators that want back doors into encrypted devices so that like, oh, a company has to build a back door uh, into their device so that the government can easily access it in case we need to. Um, but, uh, that's a very slippery slope, first of all. Uh, but also just making a back door at all means someone is going to find it. And it's not, you, you know, just making it de defeats the purpose of security altogether. Um, yeah, uh, Plops mentions the, the most recent ones are Earn It, which is a stupid name and laid and and yes the, the the argument often used is won't anyone think of the children and like oh how we could stop all of these things if only we had access to this information 
And it's, it's, I don't know, it's a very long argument we could have about privacy and inter internet security and uh, sort of the mishandling of it or misunderstanding of it by government. But uh, once you... Uh, once you allow a government to decrypt anyone they don't like's information, uh, that allows them access to uh, information that should be private and uh, should be protected by the Constitution. But all that to say, uh, we got 10 minutes left, so let's uh, run through the quiz. It's a little bit shorter this week. Um, uh, just because, yeah, this, this content was more talky. But, uh, yeah, so you're going to go to Kahoot.it, and then you're going to put in a magical number to join us for a little quiz. Uh-huh. Okay. So, Kahoot.it, and then you're going to enter the PIN number, 606. 4881. And you could use your phone, you could use a laptop, uh, I guess, or a desktop. You could use a powerful server. You could use a virtual machine. I don't care, but uh, feel free to join in. Just a little review of what we went over this class. And again, it's a short one, so uh, yeah. Thanks for joining, everybody. Nice to have you on board, student doctor. Welcome back, Pixel and Plops. And Firo's joined up, and Negihama's back. And uh, Negihama, I got your email. Uh, Negihama was top of the boards last week for the uh, the month long review. So I'm going to be sending them a fancy book. Uh, it's going to be no oh, green screen is not. Oh, there it goes. Weird. It was okay for a second. Weird. <laughs> I don't know. But it's called the Operator Handbook. Um, it's a kind of a combination of two really popular, uh, like an updated version of two really popular little notebooks called the Red Team Field Manual and the Blue Team Field Manual that give you a lot of useful terminal commands for security tools. So looks like we got our five players. Let's get started. All right, first up, uh, I believe this is a multi-selection and twice the points. What information is freely available? And this, uh, I forgot to mention exactly all this information, but let's just see if you know. Uh, business and corporation documents, court records, domain registration information, and everything on Facebook. Absolutely everything. Uh... Yeah, I sort of forgot to go over this piece. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, yeah, business and corporation documents, all that is public. Uh, that's the one thing I did mention. Domain registration information, uh, that is also public. Uh, but you can also utilize a service through your domain registrar, where they call it like a privacy who is service. So they use a shell company to mark as the owner of the registrar so you're not releasing releasing your personal information uh and then court records are public uh i mean there can be certain things that are sealed by the court uh for various reasons especially in juvenile cases but um that's where you can find all sorts of information uh <laughs> against various public figures uh that may be sitting in very powerful places and uh, everything on Facebook was kind of like, oh, are you going to put that or not? Because uh, I just wanted to make it clear that uh, you do have some control over your privacy settings on Facebook. You can, uh, you should absolutely not have a public profile because that is a, a skimmable information super highway to your personal details. <laughs> And I mean, those quizzes that are like, oh, what's your favorite color? What's your favorite animal? What's your favorite, like, you, you know, all those images. If you've responded to those, you've basically just given a password reset, like checklist of like, oh, who's your favorite teacher? Like, those are just huge information giveaways. But you do have some control over your Facebook settings. And, you know, we're starting to see the evolution of these social media media companies, like starting to default more private information, but uh, not all of it, that's for sure. So yeah, lock up your Facebook settings. Uh, we got 
a few people on the board. Nagihama and Pixel killing it. Uh, Open-handed question. Which celebrity should have practiced better operational security? <laughs> uh, poor, poor. Yeah, and acceptable answers are also his character names. Um, and just, just one word name for a certain show about uh, water cooler life and two word name for a uh, clandestine operative <laughs> because his name is kind of hard to spell. Yeah, John. Whoa, someone got the middle name? Someone must be a fan. Uh, you should have gotten extra points for John Burke. Uh, but yeah, Jim, Jack Ryan, John Krasinski, or John Krasinski. I, I threw a Z in there just to just in case, but it looks like uh, people know how to spell his name. <laughs> and someone knows his middle name. I'm so sorry you didn't get points. Should be extra credit. Uh, all, all images contain GPS coordinates in EXIF data. Every single one. It's got GPS coordinates all over it. <sighs> yeah, so it's it's only if location settings are turned on. But as I said, there's a decent amount of devices that do that by default. So you probably should make sure that your camera settings are uh, GPS is off especially on digital cameras from like the 2000 to 2015 era. That seems to be a pretty common uh, uh, default feature. Uh, I know you all hate these puzzles, but I'll try and get out of the way for the last step. So you got to order them in the course of how they would go. So how should one perform gap analysis? So we've got, what do I know? What does this mean? How do I found out? What how do I find out? <laughs> what do I need to know? So we talked about how we might uh, sort of leverage. I wish I could get out of the way, but I'm really trapped with this green screen behind me. But that last one says, what do I need to know? Uh, so how might you order this? Uh, yeah, you've got what you know. You've got things you need to know. So how might you sort of bridge those gaps? Hmm. Hmm. So there we go. It was just those last two were flipped. So it's what do I know? Because we got to sort of gather what we know first. And you can sort of repeat this process over and over as you gather more information. But what do I know? What does this mean? Like, what can I use this to connect to? What do I need to know? What are the things that I don't have? And how do I find out? So this is just an example model of how you might be able to close some of those gaps and figure out intelligence that you didn't have before. Uh, true or false, IPv4 addresses are from 1.1.1.1 to 256.256.256. .256 .256. Five, six. It's a lot of addresses. I kind of want to look up IPv4 addresses. Because I forgot the exact number. So there's 16,777,216 addresses. Not too bad. Yeah, so that's actually 0 .0 .0 .0 to 255.255.255.255. Uh, just trying to see if you were paying attention, uh, but looks like, oh, 4 billion? Oh, because that's just, oh, that's just a class A from 0 to 127. 4 billion addresses? Plots, that's so many. Yeah, 16.7 in class A, that's right. Uh, I was looking at class A on the internet, and that's why I was like, I could swear I had something to do with 16 million, but that does not seem like enough. And apparently that's true. Uh, apparently there are 4 billion in that uh, IP space. All right, another multi-selection worth mad points. Uh, what are some useful Google search commands? Uh, in title, got file type, in text, 
an in URL. Hmm. And yeah, as Plop says, we have more humans than addresses, plus devices. We do need IPv6 soon, because how many addresses does IPv6 have? Um, is this like in the trillions? 2 to the 128th power? I can't even count that high. Uh, so yeah, all of these are actually um, things we could use in title. Again, it's looking at the title of the web page in the tab. Uh, file type is going to look at the return file type. In text is looking at the text inside the page. So what are some useful Google search commands would be in text here. And in URL is looking in here in the address bar. So these are all various things that we can use to uh, deduce further information. Oh, Nagihama and Plops. And Shodan.io can be used for good. And that's all you're going to use it for, right? Right? I mean, or can it at all? Is it only to do bad stuff? I don't know. A tool is a tool. Depends on who's wielding it, right? Yeah, so we can do some good with Shodan.io as uh, security researchers. And uh, looks like Negihama takes it. And Pixel was close. But you're all my star students, and I love you all so much. And uh, last one, this one's just a poll, no points. What did you not expect about OSINT? Oh, I should have given more time. The number of details you can discover, how insecure things can be for John Krasinski to be a normal human being, and that you can just use Google. Sorry, I should have given more time. I know there's like a five second delay, so it cuts off a little early. Uh, yeah, how insecure things can be is very surprising, and it's everywhere. But like, as you approach security and get more familiar with it, you'll start thinking about, oh, is there a hole there? Is there a hole there? And just as you build that mindset, and that sort of like, <laughs> I don't want to say paranoia, but uh, that, uh, that y you want your trust to be preserved. Let's say that instead. So, da, 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 da. third place we got Student Doctor. Second, we've got the Pixel Moth. And on the top of the board, Nagahama. Yay! All right, friends. Well, uh, that is the episode on open source intelligence. I need to eat very badly, and it's very hot in my room because I can't turn on my AC until 8 p.m. or I get charged peak electricity and my fans are off. And these all these lights on. <laughs> so I'm going to uh, head out. But uh, yeah, thank you, Firo. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Uh, I'm super excited for this month's content. We're getting a little more on the like techie stuff. And uh, yeah, so next week... We've got, uh, I think, automation. So we're going to go over, yeah, ne next week is automation and organization. So we're going to go over some scripting and how we can use computers to go fast. So thanks, y'all, again, and I will catch you next week. Bye bye bye. Bye bye now. See you later. Sayonara. Adios.